this video, we're going to be looking at Windows Server 2022, RDS, and how to make it truly highly available. And RDS is Remote Desktop Services. And as you can see, these are all inclusive setup instructions. A lot of videos that you find or tutorials from Microsoft don't include the whole picture or are missing a lot of steps. In this video series, we're going to go through each step to make a true, highly available RDS environment. The first thing that you probably already know is that you need load balancers, gateways, brokers, and your session host or your VDI host. Balancers are going to direct the traffic evenly across the environment when it's coming from an external connection. The gateway is gonna be your connection to the outside environment, and we're only gonna be opening two ports to make this happen. Those ports will be 443, typical HTTPS traffic, and also UDP 3391. That'll allow the Remote Desktop Gateway uh, UDP protocol through. The brokers are used to direct the connection to a specific session host or VDI host. And of course, your session host is probably going to be running Windows Server 2022, uh, 2019, 2016. Your VDI host, you could be running a Windows 10 or Windows 11 base image. But there's something missing from this to make it highly available. Even if you have multiple brokers, what you need to make it truly highly available is SQL availability groups. And you also need highly available file shares. In the environment we're creating, if any of the servers go down, we're going to have at least two working in parallel to take over. The requirements for this are Windows Server 2022 Data Center, and we're also going to be using SQL Server 2019 Enterprise. Now we're going to create our base image for our 11 virtual machines. And here's the name of the 11 virtual machines that I'm using. You can see we've got two domain controllers, one license server, two profile or file share stores, two SQL servers, two brokers, two gateways, and then I'm also using PFSense as the virtual router. So jumping into it, you can see I've already got a 2022 data center and a 2022 standard image. You can use a standard image and upgrade it to data center. That's not an issue. The next thing you'll want to do is download the 2022 installation media from Microsoft. Uh, that'll be server eval x64 fre that's the file name directly from microsoft and the next thing you're going to do is create a new virtual machine and we'll just call it 2022 std for standard and you can tell it where you want to save it on your hyper v host and i'm just going to put an example because i've already got this created just showing you guys how to do it. Generation one is fine. Startup memory, I'm gonna choose 9,000 meg and always use dynamic memory. Uh, connection, you'll probably just have one. In my case, I've got several uh, different subnets to choose from. We're gonna create a new virtual hard disk, 127 gig, the default is fine. And we're gonna choose install from CD, DVD, ROM. Here's where you'll choose your download for the server 2022 ISO. And then you'll hit finish. So once this is created, we're gonna connect to the machine and turn it on and go through the setup wizard. And if you're gonna go through the whole lab and don't have a whole lot of storage, I would recommend turning on uh, deduplication on your server that you're running this on and real quick to do that you can go into server manager and of course you'll need to have the deduplication file services role enabled and then just go to file and server manager you can go to disk Going back to the setup here, we'll just install.
and it's going to prompt us what we want to install. I'm going to choose uh, server 2022 standard. And you'll want to choose desktop experience as well. Okay, so back to what I was saying about the disk. If you select the volume that you're storing uh, these VMs on after you have enabled data deduplication, you can right click on the volume, configure data, data deduplication, choose virtualized desktop infrastructure, choose deduplicate files older in days, change that to zero, set your deduplication schedule to enabled, and then you'll notice as we build these machines out, it won't be taking up as much space as you would see otherwise. You'll need to accept the license agreement, click custom, click next, and then I'm going to pause the video and come back once this process is complete. While we're waiting on that server build to finish, you can go ahead and go to the uh, Microsoft Evaluation Center and download SQL Server 2019 and it's just download the exe they're going to ask you to fill out this form and then you can download the enterprise edition of the uh, of the trial the other software i mentioned was starwind vsan we're going to be installing that on the pro1 and pro2 vms and what this software does is it creates a virtual sand for you to mimic a physical SAN storage and you'll just go to starwindsoftware.com and choose the free Starwind vSAN trial. And I believe it's a 30 day, uh, 30 day evaluation. If you have a physical SAN or you've got your host as a failover cluster and you've got shared storage, you won't need it. But for the purpose of this demo, that's what I'm using. All right, so our VM is rebooting after it's finished. I'm gonna go ahead and eject the DVD. And once it comes up, we're going to set our language and country and our default password for the administrator account. And then we're going to run updates on it, reboot it, run sysprep, shut it down, and then copy it to create these clones. So you'll go ahead and set your administrator password, hit finish and then it's gonna bring you to the login screen. One thing I forgot to mention during the initial setup was we'll want to change the default processor value from one CPU to uh, you know, at least four. I'm gonna put eight in my case. So once it comes up here, I'm gonna go ahead and shut it down and then we're gonna go into settings and edit that value. That's why Windows took so long to install All right, so now that we've got eight CPU, another thing that you might want to change is the minimum RAM, changing it to 4,000, four gig, 4086. Now that we're signed in, we can go ahead and start making some configuration changes. The first thing I like to do is don't show this message again. Go into local server. While that's loading, we can go ahead and adjust the date and time to reflect our uh, current time zone. I like to then turn the IE enhanced security configuration off. The next thing we'll do is run Windows Updates.
So we'll go ahead and install all applicable updates and then we'll come back. While that's running, what you can do, uh, just so you're aware about the addition upgrade, how that works, if you open command prompt as an administrator and type dism slash online space slash git dash target additions, it'll tell you what version of Windows that you can upgrade to. So in this case, we're using the evaluation version as shown in the bottom right of the screen. Here you can see it says we can upgrade to server standard or server data, server data center. And to do that, what you would do is dism slash online slash set dash addition colon server standard slash product key. And always use the uh, automatic virtual machine activation. So if you just search server 2022 AVMA keys, it'll take you to the Microsoft site and you can enter the uh, standard edition key, which YDFW. And then you're going to do slash accept EULA. And hopefully I typed the key right. It'll tell us if not. So this is no way bypassing product activation or anything like that. It's just going to try to use the built-in uh, Windows activation because it knows it's using a Hyper-V host. It's not going to be able to activate because we're using server 2016 or server 2019 instead of 2022. And once that process completes, we can just choose no, not to restart now. All right, so we can see the updates are still going and installing, pending install. We'll wait on those to finish and then we'll reboot the machine. So after that reboot, you can see that it's adding features and that's basically just upgrading the addition from evaluation to standard. Once this completes, we'll do one more round of Windows updates and then we'll do sysprep. Now that we've completed all Windows updates, we're going to navigate to C, Windows, System32, sysprep. We're then going to double click on sysprep and we're going to choose out of box experience, choose the option to generalize, and then we want to shut down. And this process will take a few minutes. After sysprep completes, it'll automatically turn off the machine. Next, we'll want to rename the machine. And I'm just gonna put the word image after it. Now we're gonna right click and export. Choose a location that you wanna store the file. In this case, I'm going to put it on the E drive in the example folder, and I'm going to create a new folder called RA-DC1. And then I'm going to select that folder and export. Now that our export has completed, we want to go ahead and rename this yet again because when we import it, it's going to be the same name as this machine and that will cause a conflict for us. All right, the next thing you'll want to do, since we exported that into a folder, the RADC1, I'm going to go ahead and copy this image here, that folder, and we're going to create a new folder for all of our other machines. So like RADC2, and I'm just going to do these two as an example. Of course, we've got 11, and you'll have to do the same process for those. And then basically, we're going to copy the 2022 standard image into the RADC2. And once that completes, we're going to import 
the virtual machines for each folder. The next thing we're going to do is import the machines. And to do that, we're just going to go to import virtual machine, choose the folder that we saved the RADC1, and click on the 2022 standard image, click select folder, click next, click next. And you're always going to choose copy the virtual machine. That way it creates a, a new unique identifier for it. And I always put these folders, set them back to the same directory that we're working in. So for example, this folder. And then we're gonna copy that path and use it for the same three settings. And we're gonna choose the virtual hard disk folder within that path and then finish. Okay, so you'll notice that it kept the name uh, as what we had originally. So I'm just gonna verify that this is the one that we're working with. So it is in the correct folder, RADC1. So at this point you would right click, rename. And then when we power that machine on, it's gonna go through the first time setup wizard. So it's already got all the updates. It's already got our password set. Our time zone will be set. Uh, a few other preferences that you may want to put in there is a good time to do that before you sysprep it. So that's what you'll need to do to create the 11 machines that were listed earlier. And once you do that, then we'll be ready for the next step. Next, we'll need to install the roles for Active Directory on our RADC1 machine. And I've already got it installed on here, but I'm going to go through the steps. So the roles you'll want to add are Active Directory Domain Services, DHCP Server, DNS Server. And you'll go through the steps of configuring the Active Directory Domain Services. And then once that's complete, you'll join the RA-DC2 machine to the same domain and in this example, it's ad.remoteapp.us. Once you've went through that process, you'll want to create a couple of group policies and also organizational units for machines within our deployment. Here you can see we have a broker's OU, file servers, gateways, remote access services, users OU, a licensing OU, SQL, VDI host, and also host servers. Within the brokers OU, we'll see the two uh, broker servers that you created. You'll want to put those in this OU. And then you'll want to create a security group where the members are the computer names of your broker servers. For your file servers, you're going to have the Pro 1 and Pro 2 machines. And then these other objects will be created later uh, once we create the failover cluster. Your gateways, you'll want to put both of those in there. Your users, you can put those in the RAS users. For SQL, you'll have the SQL 1 and 2 machines. Uh, we'll have the failover cluster network later. Your SQL admins, you'll want to create another security group which contains the SQL uh, computers. Our VDI host will contain our session host server that we created. Before we drill down in the policy for the RDS optimization, something I need to note is I downloaded FS Logics and created a central policy store for our group policy. I would recommend you going ahead and doing the same thing. Here are the steps you need to do that. From a computer joined on the domain, go to your domain name, click on Sysvol, click on your domain name again, click on policies, and then you'll notice there's a folder here that you probably don't have, policy definitions. Go ahead and create that folder, and within it, you need to create an en-us folder. And then you also notice there's an fslogics.adlmx file. 
you'll need to open another file explorer window on your computer and you're going to want to copy all of the contents except for the ENUS folder. Once those are copied, you'll want to navigate into the ENUS folder in both of those directories. Copy all of the contents once again. What this does is replicates all of the policy information between all the domain controllers and makes it accessible for every computer on the network, rather than manually updating the policy on each domain controller. All right, so back to policy definitions. You notice I had the FS logics. So here's the Microsoft site for FS logics. Download and install FS logics. <clears throat> You'll want to download the file if you're entitled. You can download it here. And we'll want English. And you can see it's 173 meg. Once it downloads, we're going to open the zip file. Once the download's complete, you'll notice there's two ADML and ADMX files. The ADML file you'll want to copy into the ENUS folder within your central policy store and the ADLMX file you'll want to copy into the policy definitions. Once you have those items copied, you'll then see the options for FS logics. You also want to copy out the release uh, for FS logics app setup. You'll want to put that into another folder. And the folder we're going to use for that, we're going to call it util and we're going to copy in our FS Logics app setup into there. Say that three times fast. So that'll get us going for the uh, profile management part of the video. So now going back to the RDS optimization, we can take a look at those uh, settings and see what they actually do. Before I copied all that material from the central store or from the local store to the central store, I only was able to see the FS Logics uh, folder here. So it was kind of concerning when I looked and there was nothing in the group policy. So if we sort it by status under computer configuration policies, administrative templates, you can see high notifications about RD licensing problems. That's disabled. We don't need our users to see if there's a licensing problem. And then you can see the other options here that I have selected. Let's go through them just to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page. For your RDP experience, let the system choose experience. Enable remote FX encoding for remote FX clients designed for Windows Server 2008 R2 Service Pack 1 is enabled. Configure image quality for remote FX. Adaptive graphics is enabled and set to medium. Configure compression for remote FX data is enabled and set to optimized to use less network bandwidth. Configure H264 AVC hardware encoding for remote desktop connections is set to enabled. Prioritize HTC 264 AVC 444 graphics mode for remote desktop connections is set to enable. Use advanced remote FX graphics for remote app is set to enabled. Optimize visual experience for remote desktop services sessions is set to rich multimedia and enabled. Optimize visual experience when using remote FX is enabled. The screen capture rate or frames per second is set to medium and the screen image quality is set to medium. Configure remote FX is set to enabled. Set remote desktop licensing mode to per user and use the specified remote desktop license server that's set to enabled and if you notice we've got the name of the license server plus the IP address of the license server. Now, of course, your IP address is probably different depending on your network setup. Allow time zone redirection is set to enabled. Limit audio playback quality enabled and it's set to dynamic. 
allow redirection for recording is set to enabled. Allow audio and video playback redirection is set to enabled. Allow RDP connection of other supported remote FX USB devices from this computer is set to enabled and allowed for users and administrators. And finally, high notifications about RD licensing problems is set to disabled as previously mentioned. So those are all of the policies that are set for RDS optimization within this GPO. And the last group policy that we have to create is the FS Logics Profile Policy. While this isn't going to work just yet for you because it's not set up completely, you can go ahead and create the GPO. So under Computer Configuration, Policies, Administrative Templates, FS Logics, we have the status set to enabled, and of course we checked enabled. Flip-flop directory name is enabled, and what this means is instead of putting the SID in front of the username, it's going to have the username in front of the SID. That makes it easier for a human to look and see what the profile is named. Is dynamic is set to enabled, and check is dynamic. Prevent login with failure is set to enable, and prevent login with failure is checked. If there's an issue with connection to FS Logics during user logon, it's going to prevent them from logging in. And it's also going to prevent login with temp temporary profile. We're going to enable that and check prevent login with temp profile. Profile type is set to enabled, and I like to choose read, write, profile, fall back to read only. So if there's only one session that the user is using, it's going to lock the read write on that profile. If there's another session and the user tries to log in, it's going to create a read only profile. And then it's going to create a differencing disk. Once the user logs off, it's going to merge the differencing disk with the read write profile. Remove orphaned OST files on log off. I have that set to enabled and checked. Size in megabytes. I'm limiting the profile disk to 10 gig, so 10,000 megabytes. The VHD locations. So this is that highly available storage that we're going to create. And our share name for that is profiles is the name of the path. Volume type is enabled and it's VHDX. And that's all the settings for FS Logics at this time. So, in review, we've created our base image, we've deployed our servers, we've joined those servers to the new domain we created, we set up the group policy objects, we created security groups for the SQL and file servers. The next thing we're going to do is jump into the file servers to take a look at how that highly available storage is set up, configuring Starwind, and creating the shares. Before getting started with file services, you'll need to upgrade your Windows to Data Center Edition. You'll follow the same prompts that we did earlier in the DISM section, except you're going to upgrade to Data Center and use the Data Center automatic virtual machine activation key. Once that's completed, your machine will reboot. Once you're back online, you'll want to install the uh, system data archiver feature, as well as multi-path and failover clustering. All of these require a system reboot. After your system's back up, go ahead and shut it down, and we're going to create a 4 terabyte VHDX file for each of the machines. So we're going to create a second hard drive and map it here under IDE controller 0. Then you're going to add two additional network interfaces, and they can be on the same subnet as your primary interface but these are needed for the heartbeat and failover capabilities within Starwind. I'm going to show you how I have the network configured on these VMs 
so you can mimic it within your environment. So the first Ethernet adapter that was installed on the machine is our domain connection. You may need to look at the properties or the settings of the MAC address for each of the adapters, and you may even wish to set static MAC addresses to the adapters after the machine's booted for the first time. So looking at the Ethernet network, 172.16.6.15 is this machine's IP address on the domain. We then have the management network adapter, which I have a static IP address, and it's not routable, of 172.16.4.15. Finally, we have the sync IP network of 172.16.5.15. So as you can imagine, we go over here to the other machine. Our active directory is .14, our management, is 4.14 and our sync is 5.14. So although we're using the same physical network, we have different subnets associated with the sync and management network for Starwind. Now there's a great tutorial from Starwind and if you just search Starwind vSAN configuring HA shared storage for scale out file server, you'll come up with this article. And it basically shows you what I did of going through MPIO, we added that, and then once your machine reboots, you're gonna go into MPIO and add support for iSCSI. So discover multipaths, you'll wanna check iSCSI devices. That'll require a reboot. Uh, the next thing they go through is downloading the software and installing it. You can choose the defaults, choose the valuation key. And then they get into configuring shared storage. So the new drive that we created, this is why we created that volume and formatted it because we chose the path to be that new three terabyte drive. And then we're adding a storage volume for our profiles and in my case, I did it as a three terabyte, so 3000 gig. And then I just followed the steps on this tutorial for setting up that connection. And then the important thing is going into Replication Manager because so far you have to create the same storage on both the Profile 1 and Profile 2 server. Then you're gonna go into Replication Manager, create a synchronous two-way replication, the host name of the other server, you're going to choose Heartbeat, uh, you're going to create the partner device, you're going to tell it where you want to create it, which would be the new drive you created on the other server, and then you're going to do change network settings, and then this is where I was talking about the management and sync. So synchronization and Heartbeat, it can be that secondary adapter, and then the third adapter can be just the Heartbeat. That way you're not intermingling your domain traffic with iSCSI traffic. And you wanna choose synchronize from existing device. And then you can see they've got, just like I do here, the uh, two different storage units. So we've got two different storage images. One's the four terabyte for file, for profiles. And the other's a two terabyte for uh, our SQL quorum. So once you've got that set up, you'll want to open up iSCSI and then you're going to connect to both the local IP address and the remote IP address of the other server. And you're going to do that on both sides. And this is kind of outside of the scope of the video, but I'm just trying to give you some more information about Starwind, how it was set up. And you can see the targets are all listed. And I always like to go into MPIO for each device and check that it's set to round robin. Also, multiple, multiple connection session, making sure that's set to round robin for each of those listed. 
So once you've got that set up, then we're going to set up the failover clustering. So I'm going to go ahead and open our failover cluster. And here's where it got a little tricky. So we created a new cluster. And you can do that here, uh, create cluster. And you're going to choose the servers, so RA Pro 1, RA Pro 2. And it's already in the cluster, so we can't go through the wizard. But you're going to go through the validation. Access point for administering the cluster, it's going to ask you what you want the name to be. And so if you recall in the Active Directory Domain Computers. Oops. Under File Servers, we have the um, client access point. And that's basically what you're setting on that step, and you're assigning an IP address to it. And then it creates the cluster, and then you're finished. Now the whole point of the Starwind was so we could have shared, highly available storage for these failover cluster nodes. So under the storage, like I mentioned, I've got the two disks. We've got one for the X or the profiles and one for the SQL. So those are listed. And then let's look at the role here, how it's set up. So I, of course, created a secondary client access point for RA-SQLWIT. That's the SQL witness disk. And you can see here it's got a share that I created uh, for SQL HA witness. And let's look at the properties on that share. So our permissions are for those two SQL Server computer accounts and the connection broker to have full control to that folder. And you want it to be continuously available and we don't need to cache the data. So back to the profiles, if we go to properties, there's a little bit more detailed permissions that need to be set up. So let's customize permissions. And you can see here administrators have full control, system has full control, the creator owner has full control, but subfolders and files only. That's important so they can't get into other people's documents. And you have got domain users. That's going to be the people that are logging in. They have modify access to this folder only. And then finally, your domain admins have this folder, subfolders, and files. So if you hit edit on that, that's where you can actually edit those permissions that I just mentioned. And it's continuously available, and we're not caching it either. So that's pretty much the setup for the high availability for these two file shares. So at any time, I could reboot this server, and if there were connections to it, it would automatically fail over to the other server, and vice versa. Going into roles, we can see that this one is, uh, the profiles is running on profile two server. We can change it to profile one. And just like that, all the connections were changed and nobody got disconnected. There's a whole lot more to failover clustering. I've just kind of skimmed the surface. I've also got it set to allow failback immediately. And you can see the settings here. I've got that set for each of those roles running here. 
The other thing you'll need to do uh, for the SQL witness is back on your DC for your file servers OU, go into properties, and you'll need to enable advanced mode, advanced features, security, advanced, and you'll notice here that cluster uh, user has access to create computer objects and that's important because otherwise when you try to create roles it's not going to be successful so create computer objects must be checked also under your SQL OU go into advanced security you want your SQL 1, SQL 2, the connection broker group, and your uh, SQL access point all to be able to create computer objects. Otherwise, it'll fail when you're trying to create your access points. The next part of our setup is with the SQL servers. Just like we did with our profile file storage servers, we need to do the addition upgrade to data center and we also need to install the Windows failover clustering role. Once that's complete we'll need to install SQL 2019 Enterprise on both of the servers and while doing so you'll want to choose the options for high availability. Once that's installed we're going to create a new cluster just like we did for the profiles. Once you create the cluster, you're going to set up the cluster name, in this example RDS SQL1. You're going to need to go to the domain controller and allow permissions for that new cluster computer to create computer objects in the same organizational unit, just like we did with the file servers. Once that's complete, you'll go into SQL Server Configuration Manager, open your SQL Server LMS SQL Server, and we left the defaults for everything during installation. Go on to High Availability Groups and choose Always Enable. And you're going to do that on both servers. Once that's done, you're going to create a database on one of the servers, it doesn't matter which. <clears throat> and in this case, we named it DB1. And you're going to back it up once you've created it. So you can do right click, task, backup. And then you're going to proceed with the backup and you can use that file to restore the database onto the other server to make it highly available. Now what I found was the easiest thing to do was create a new database. Now I'm just going to name it DB2. and your recovery model needs to be full. So we're going to take a backup of the database. And you can see there the path it's taking for the backup. So now you can create an availability group by going into the availability group wizard. You'll choose next. You can name the group and you're going to choose Windows Server Failover Cluster. I'm just going to name it test. <clears throat> you can select the database that you created. 
and then it's going to have you connect to the replica servers. <clears throat> and also part of the SQL setup is I always like to go in to SQL Server Browser and also Agent um, and set those to automatically start. And you'll want to ensure that shared memory and TCP IP is enabled. <clears throat> so we're already on RASQL1. We're going to add a replica. It's going to ask us to connect to the other server. And if you get a certificate message, what you can do is uh, choose the option Trust Server Certificate. That way that message doesn't prohibit you from moving forward. And you can see here asynchronous commit. And I always like to choose failover with synchronous commit on all of them. And then you're going to go into endpoints. Those look correct. Uh, locations fine. And we're also going to create a avail availability group listener. And this is where you need those permissions that we mentioned earlier about creating computer names or objects. So you can create your DNS listener name. I'm just going to name it test2. And it's going to be on port 1433. Uh, you're going to put a static IP on this, any that you set, that you desire. Next. Now, I tried doing skip initial data synchronization based on another guy that I saw. <clears throat> After fighting with it for quite some time, trying to take a backup and restore, I found that it's easier to do automatic seeding. That way it automatically copies itself. So all of our tests passed. We can see the summary. Now it's actually going through and creating it. And sometimes that group listener, it always takes a minute to create. If it takes more than 30 seconds, it's probably a permissions issue. So you can see here our um, test. This is our primary server on SQL 1. On SQL 2, if we do a refresh, we should see that database. Yep. And we can see that they're both synchronized. If I hit refresh, it'll say synchronized here. <coughs> And if you wanted to fail it over, you can go into roles. And now you'll notice we have two roles, one for the uh, actual production listener and the other one for the one we just created. There we go, test. And you can see the IP address 172.16.6.55. <clears throat> so that's pretty much all there is to creating the high availability group. Now, I'm going to delete that group since I'm not actually using it. So always on high availability, availability groups. And something to note that's very helpful is show dashboard on availability groups. It'll show you where there's a problem if there is one. Uh, I always recommend start failover. So let's try a failover to make sure it works. And there's no errors reported. Let's see if it'll fail over. And it completed successfully. Now I'm going to go through the process of removing this test availability group. You can see over here, it's now been removed from the failover cluster. 
Next, we need to delete the database itself. Now the database has been removed. One other thing to mention, with SQL Server 2019, you're gonna to wanna to enable SQL Server and Windows Authentication mode. And we're gonna set up a login for the server. You'll need to do that so that your brokers can connect. So if you go under logins, you can see we have the RDFCB group. And if you recall from the beginning of the video, that group has both computer objects for our connection brokers, RA-BRO1 and BRO2. And if we look at the properties for that logon, you'll see that it's mapped, well, it's <clears throat> mapped to the database one, but we're not able to see that because right now SQL 2 is the primary. So let's go here and go to properties. Okay, and you're able to see it's a DB creator and it's public and user mapping is set to DB1 and it's the DB owner. So you're going to need to set that on your database. And just like you saw the error here when I tried to set it on the secondary server, it wouldn't allow it. So going back and putting it on the other server allowed us to continue. So in SQL 2019, there's an option under Properties Advanced, and you'll need to do this on both the host to change your cost threshold for parallelism to 25 and change your max degree of parallelism to eight. So what this will do is allow more connections to those SQL servers. Oftentimes that can be a bottleneck. Uh, when it appears that your connection broker is being slow, it's actually the SQL server is being slow and this will fix that issue. Our next step is gonna be setting up the broker server and deploying the farm. You'll want to go into your RA-BRO1 server, open Server Manager and go to All Servers, and then you'll want to click Manage and Add Servers. You'll want to add both brokers, both gateways, the licensing, and the session host. Now I'm going to move over to the SQL server since I've already got this set up, and I'm going to show you what the wizard would look like on your screen. So you're going to go to Manage, Add Roles and Features, you're going to do remote desktop services installation. Uh, you're going to do a standard deployment because it's across multiple servers. We're going to be doing a session based desktop deployment. Click next. For the connection broker, you'll choose your RA CB1. Just ignore that I'm clicking the wrong server. For your web access, you're going to choose Gateway 1 and Gateway 2 server and add both of those into the group. For your session host, you're going to put in the um, virtualization server that you added. and then it'll give you the option to deploy. So I'm gonna cancel out of that. <clears throat> and once you've got that deployed, we can go back to the wizard and set up high availability. So now that we're back in the overview, we can see our deployment. So we've got the one session host. You're not gonna have a collection yet, but you can add that real easily. Uh, just go into collections, task, Create session collection, name it what you wish, select your session host, 
and of course we're not going to do profile disk because we're using the FS logics for that and by default it puts domain users which is fine for this test all right so back up here to the top we can go up to task and edit deployment properties and the DNS name for RD connection broker cluster how we set that up it's not automatic. You have to create a DNS entry. And if you recall, we're running DNS on our DC1 machine. So I'm just going to open up DNS. And RDSCB is the host name. And you can see it's pointing to 27 and dot 28. And quick glance up here, we can see that 27 and 28 is our broker servers. So on here you'll notice the DNS name rdscb.ad.remoteapp.us. Before we continue, you'll need to access your SQL installation media and install the native SQL client on both of your brokers. And that's important because it contains the driver that's used for this connection string. Now what took me the longest time, other than trying to get the databases to sync, was getting the connection string to be correct. And so here's what that looks like. Driver equals SQL server native client 11, semicolon server equals SQL HA underscore DB1. And this will vary depending on what you put for your uh, host name. Multi subnet failover is true. Trusted connection, yes. And then app equals remote desktop services connection broker. Database equals DB1. So DB1, we know that's our database here, our primary database. And then we've got our server SQL HA DB1. That's our client access name for the high availability group. So just for your reference, so you can see where those values came from. Once you do this, get that data entered and apply it, the database moves from the local broker to the shared availability group. Now, once you've done that, you'll notice that it changes from not saying high availability high availability mode to saying high availability. And now you've got the option to add a connection broker server. And so on the other server, all you have to do is select the server from the list, bro2, confirm, and finish. Now both of those connection brokers are active. With having multiple connection brokers, we want to increase the number of WMI uh, transactions that each broker can handle. And to do that, we can open up W uh, Windows Management Instrumentation Tester, and we're going to click on Connect, and we're going to change our namespace to root. And then we're going to enum instances, and we're going to put in here underscore underscore provider host quota configuration. And you're going to double click on it. And then you're going to scroll down, and we're going to find handles per host. The default is 4096. You want to update the value to what I have here, 8192 and 0x2000. And then you're going to do save property, um, save object, close, and exit. And you'll want to do that on both of your connection brokers. And that's going to help ensure that you have plenty of 
uh, space for WMI connections between these brokers. So next up we're going to take a look at the gateway and if we edit our deployment properties you can see I've got the gateway set as connect.remoteapp.us the licensing I've got set as the RALIC1 server and it's set to per user and we're also setting that through group policy RD web access uh, we've got it listed here for both of our gateways and then our certificates this used to confuse me quite a bit about where you use which certificate and in this lab I've actually got it set up using let's encrypt and I've got a script that runs to update the certificate on all the brokers the gateways so that there's no certificate warnings at all and it's all fully automated and it doesn't cost anything to perform it so we'll go through that as well so moving on to the gateway we're going to go to RAGW1 and since it was already installed during our deployment you'll notice there's remote desktop gateway manager I'm going to open up gateway 2 as well because I just remember UDP isn't turned on that one when I set it up. And here's what I'm talking about. When we go to policy preferences on the gateway one and choose transport settings, by default UDP is not enabled. So I've enabled it. It creates much better performance across the environment for your users. So you'll want to do that on both servers. And while that's loading, like I mentioned, I'm using Let's Encrypt. So I downloaded the Let's Encrypt Windows uh, Certificate Management. And we'll go through these scripts and show you how I've got it set up. It's pretty neat where you don't ever have to touch the certificate and it automatically updates every 90 days. So on here I created a new managed certificate and I did the certificate for connect.remoteapp.us which is going to be our gateway and also the web host and then I did asterisk or wildcard.ad.remoteapp.us and that's because the internal domain name is .ad that way it covers any server like ra-pro1.ad etc And we're using GoDaddy as our DNS host. Deployment set to auto. And the task is, the first thing it does is export the certificate. So I'm telling it to export the certificate. If the renewal is successful, it runs as the current service user, puts it on the C drive. Then it waits for 30 seconds. And then I've got it running a PowerShell script. Um, the scripting features within certify the web this app isn't that great so it's running c run dot ps1 we'll take a look at that powershell script it basically kicks off a bash file so it runs scheduled task run tn update serves so i had to create a scheduled task And that was because I was having problems with permissions with PowerShell running. And so the scheduled task is called update certs. 
and we'll just look at the properties here. So it's a one-time run. It's configured for server 2022, running with highest privileges. Uh, it triggers the one time, which as you can see, it's already passed. And it's going to run a program or start a program C run cert dot bat. And if we take a look at that batch file, it's telling it to run PowerShell execution bypass uh, and run the file C cert update dot PS1. So a very convoluted way to update the certificates, but it does work. So here is the script, and I found this on the internet. I'll kind of pause it here for a second so you can take a look. So it's basically importing the module remote desktop and then telling it to set the RD certificate for the role publishing and the path to the certificate and there's not a password on the pfx file so it, that's left out connection broker is broker one and force and it runs that for web access you notice there's two of those uh, there's two gateways and then i've got down here for broker two now it's going to error out if for some reason you were filled over to broker two and broker one wasn't active it's going to give it error and we'll just skip that step and go on to the next one. That way, no matter if it's failed over, if I'm doing maintenance, it's gonna update the certificates when the need arises. And I'll just go ahead and kick this off so you can see what would happen. I'm gonna do it manually because if I do it from here, you won't actually see it. So in the background, it's updating those certificates. And if you had additional web or broker or gateway servers, uh, you would need to add additional lines in the text field. And if there's no errors, the window will close automatically. It takes probably five minutes or so for this to run. So I'm just gonna pause the video. So you can see here it's erroring out because the <coughs> connection broker 2 is not being used currently. So that's what would happen and it would automatically skip the error and bypass it. So now that we're over an hour into this process in movie time, let's take a look at our session host. Earlier we looked at FS logics and we put a um, copy of that installer out in our sysvol util folder. And you can go ahead and run that accepting the defaults for it. And once you've done that, uh, reboot the machine and then your profiles will be able to be stored. So a lot's gonna happen here. I'm gonna sign in to the system and I've already got my certificate loaded so if I go to connect.remoteapp.us I've got these apps published and to publish an app we're going to go back to our broker
And under our collections, you can see here I've got Calculator, Edge, and Notepad. Those are all going to run off that session host server that I showed you just a second ago. I'm also going to pull up our Profiles folder. on the file server. So you can see what happens when a user logs in for the first time. So I'm going to launch Calculator. It's going to prompt me again for my password. And then after a few seconds, I type my password wrong. Okay, now that I figured out what my password is, let me type it again. You can see it's securing, connecting. I should be able to see it on the gateway. Right now I've just got the firewall open to one gateway. I can see here, that's my client IP address. It's still negotiating. I really need some faster machines. Right, so it's waiting for the FS Logics app service. It's applying our settings, preparing windows. Then we should have a calculator pop up here in a second. I should see two connections here now in our gateway manager. We can see the target computer for both of those. One of these is the UDP and one is the uh, HTTPS connection. And here's calculator. It looks kind of funny. I think it's something with the screen recording program. So that works. I should be able to see if I disconnect that session, this will go away. So that session's been terminated. Let's try opening it. Let's try opening uh, Notepad. 
It's going to prompt for credentials. And it should be much faster to launch since there's already a session active. And here's Notepad running on the RDS session host. I can do Control Alt End, bring up Task Manager, and it's going to bring it up on the server. Now, something about the screen recording program it does not like how oh, that shows up. So, anyway, if we go in our broker and refresh, we should see that there's an active connection. I could send a message. They're not going to see it because there's no apps open. I can log the user off or shadow their session. So in our shares, profiles, there's my user profile that was created at 3.43 and there's our hard disk image file. Now this could be truly redundant if we had something like a Kemp load balancer or even uh, Microsoft IIS reverse proxy in front of the environment. Those could be load balanced. I'm gonna to try to do another video on that and also a video on Ilmes IX packaging and what the future looks like for virtualized apps. So that's all exciting stuff with Server 2019 and 2022 especially. So stay tuned.